the strange unraveling of Laszlo Fringe. Professor Laszlo Fringe sat slack-jawed in the dark, watching a test pattern on the TV in his room at the Hotel Gellert, trying to imagine what might have been. But it was too late. All the channels were off the air. He pushed the red panic button on the pilot and killed the signal. Instantly, a thin skin of light shot into the room through the narrow gap in the velvet curtains. It resembled a length of wrapping paper drawn from a vertical roll, the kind he used to find in the gift wrap department back in the days when escalators were made of wood. He thought how interesting it would be if he could tear off a length of that light and wrap something in it. Having nothing better to do, he followed the progress of a flock of migrating dust motes passing through the light. For a moment he was certain their movement looked coordinated, as if they were trying to get his attention. Shrugging off that thought, he arose and pulled back the curtains to reveal a phalanx of unwashed windows. He touched his nose to the nearest pane and, and opened his eyes wide hoping to discern his fate in the filmy swirl. Outside, a gauzy spray of light fell from the street lamps like mist from a shower head. The moisture from his breath soon condensed on the pane under his nose. Leslie French had a problem. Always rubbing shoulders with the great without ever becoming one of them, he had staked the waning years of his career in theoretical physics on his strong opposition to string theory. He had thought himself on firm ground, especially since there was no real evidence, much less proof, that strings existed. Sadly, and despite his many years in academia, he had failed to take adequate account of the power of fashion trends in the sciences. Finding himself unable to make his voice heard above the harmonious twang of vibrating string fellows, much less publish, he had become resigned to an early and obscure retirement. In itself, this was not such an awful fate. He found it quite easy to stomach the indifference of his colleagues, whom he often described as a seraglio of flirting eunuchs. What had truly galled his sense of the order of things was the prospect of being expelled from the venal colony of academia by a bumbling bloviatrix like Dr. Joan Dark, chair of the physics department. Leslow had been fine-tuning his resentment against Dr. Dark for three years, ever since she had gained ascendancy in the department. As he saw it, her meteoric rise to the top of the academic meat slurry had come about through the same mechanism that allows the fog of war to mask a heinous atrocity. While his description of her as a roughly hewn bully broad who owed her position to quota filling rather than to academic accomplishments or administrative prowess was substantially correct, Laszlo had not helped his case by letting his contempt shine quite so brightly. He knew the end was nigh when the university student-run newspaper printed a cartoon he had drawn showing Dr. Dark emerging from the physics building dressed in bib overalls and a floppy floral hat. A sign reading D-Brain or P-Brain hovered over her head which was depicted as a ball of string. The final straw, however, was the bug-eyed buzzard leaning against the building, holding its stomach, and vomiting into the bushes. Since Laszlo never admitted to having drawn the cartoon, and there was no way to prove he had, the administration was unable to fire him outright. Nevertheless, he had not been at all surprised when Dr. Dark summoned him into her office a few days later. With his nose still pressed to the pane, he replayed the scene once again just to keep it fresh. 
The department has voted to invite you to the String Fellows Conference in Budapest next month in acknowledgement of your many years of service to the university, Dr. Dark said. This, of course, is contingent upon your decision to retire immediately after the conference. We will host a retirement party for you in Budapest, which I trust will be a nice send-off, especially since, as I understand, you are of Hungarian extraction. To short-circuit any further discussion, Dr. Dark sprang from her chair and conducted Laszlo to the door. Extending her hand, she said, Well, good luck to you, Laszlo, and try to remember us fondly. He shook her hand and departed without a word. No matter how bad it is to be forced into early retirement by this trend-surfing careerist, he muttered to himself in the hallway, being forced to endure yet another soul-murdering string theory conference is surely cruel and unusual punishment. Laszlo closed the curtains and returned to his chair. Firing up a Cuban cigar, he poured himself a large glass of toque and raised the toast to the puking buzzard. Long may he hurl. Placing the empty glass on the side table, he noted that the skin of light had returned along with the dust motes. To amuse himself, he blew cigar smoke at the light. He'd always liked to watch cigar smoke pass through light. Yet this time, rather than simply passing through, it swirled around what appeared to be a solid object. Invisible before the smoke revealed its shape. Curious, he directed a huge mouthful of smoke straight at the light and leaned forward to get a good look. The face of a man, impassive and unblinking, emerged from inside the swirling smoke. Laszlo leaned closer until their noses nearly touched. He felt like he was looking into a mirror at an unrecognizable face. Bloody hell, that's a strong cigar, Laszlo, it said, coughing loudly several times. Startled by the abrupt coming to life of this ephemeral figure, Laszlo retreated into the depths of his chair and reached for the toque. Who are you? he asked, wiping his mouth on his sleeve. Seeing that the face had almost disappeared, he blew more smoke. I am Janusz Marszalko. Sculptor of the Chain Bridge Lions. Leslie burst out laughing. Convinced that he was drunk or asleep, or that this was some trick the other physics professors were playing on him, he scoured the room looking for projection equipment and sound devices. He found none, but he did find the name of Janusz Marszalko in his guidebook. By now the face had disappeared again. He blew another huge mouthful of smoke. And this racket, Lazo, you won't learn anything when the smoke clears. So just keep it coming and listen to me. Laszlo opened a fresh bottle of toque, placed it on the table next to his box of cigars, and settled in for a long sit. First, the bad news. Your colleagues, the string fellows, are essentially on the right track and you are not. There are indeed multiple parallel universes, and sometimes they cross. That's how you are able to see and hear me. How did you get where you are, Lazo asked. I fell into it, in a manner of speaking, Janos said. The legend about me is true. I was sick to death of people asking me why the lions I sculpted have no tongues especially when they do have tongues, as anyone can plainly see from the proper angle. I was the butt of every joke in Budapest. Unable to get any new commissions, I spent my days wandering around the city until one day, as I was walking across the chain bridge, some grubby little smart-mouthed street urchin asked me about the tongues. I couldn't take it any more and jumped off the bridge. Sounds like an extreme reaction to me, Laszlo said. Very likely. In retrospect, I should have thrown the little puke into the drink and continued on my way. But hindsight is always twenty-twenty. Still, there was an upside. 
Before reaching the water, I fell through a passage into my current dimension of existence. That's why no one ever found a body. Lucky you, Leslie said. Where can I find one of these passages? I could use a new dimension to my life about now. You can't. Not from where you are, at least not yet. Some of us fall into it, some step in it. It's a cosmic crapshoot. Is this a teaser for some multi-level marketing scam you're pushing here? No, but that does bring me to the good news. I have a free gift for you. A solution to your problems with Dr. Dark. Liza burst out laughing. And what's in it for you? The satisfaction of seeing someone get their just desserts. And that is no small thing. I know you are skeptical, but what have you got to lose? Well, when you put it that way, nothing. So what's next? Wise choice. Here's what you do. Standing at the lectern, Leslie surveyed the pestilential assemblage of hot and cold running sycophants with bemused detachment, unburdened by any expectations for his future. Then rising above the tepid hubbub of disinterested tutting and clucking, Leslie began to speak. Ladies, gentlemen, colleagues, and especially Dr. Dark here at my left, our esteemed chair of the physics department, I have wandered aimlessly in the wilderness of ignorance for far too long. Tonight I stand before you a repentant soul returning to the light of reason. The room froze in silence. Just last night I had a vision that convinced me string theory will one day light the way to a better world for all mankind. The audience shifted uncomfortably in their chairs and looked questioningly at each other across the banquet table. Your skepticism is well-founded. Were I in your position, I would not believe me either, especially after the circumstances surrounding my retirement, regarding which I can assure you I have no intention of returning to academia after tonight. An audible sigh of relief rose from the audience, especially from Dr. Dark. Indeed, my days of playing a bit part in this third-rate kabuki production, especially with a bunch of sorry arsed cardboard cutouts like you lot, are gone forever. I have observed conclusive evidence of the existence of parallel dimensions, and I intend to pursue this research on my own. A noticeable shudder of embarrassment crackled through the room. Of course, I am also convinced that your various approaches to string theory are nothing but flimsy paper cliché constructs that have, at best, a palimpsestual relationship with the truth. Indeed, I recall one of your number gaining academic tenure on the basis of his rigorous research into the weighty question if a solipsist commits suicide in an uninhabited apartment house, will the body ever be found? At this, Professor Mallard erupted with loud gasping and hawking noises until, at length, he expectorated a large piece of artichoke heart that had become lodged in his throat. He covered the offending morsel with his napkin, but he could not hide himself from the beady-eyed stares of his colleagues, many of whom wondered how he could have secured tenure on the basis of such thin gruel. Then again, he was rumored to be an exceptionally cunning linguist, and they all knew how much Dr. Dark enjoyed wordplay. But enough of the petty past, Laszlo continued. To celebrate the bright new future of our profession, I have availed myself of the services of Mickey Molnar, head chef of this lovely hotel and the host of Hungary's most popular television cooking show, to prepare a sculpted baked Alaska for tonight's dessert. After dinner, he will be available to sign copies of his latest book, Steal Two Eggs. At his signal... Several waiters wheeled out an enormous cart, 
supporting a meringue sculpture of two chain bridge lions, each three feet tall, facing a five foot high meringue representation of the castle hill, complete with a chocolate tunnel. They positioned the dessert cart with the lions facing Dr. Dark, her head still visible above the hill's summit. Laszlo grabbed the microphone and retreated to the far end of the stage area where he stood in the shadows. With cooing and gurgling sounds still bubbling from the crowd, he continued, With this creation, I honor all those who seek the truth. We do not have all the answers yet, but I can promise you that the light we see at the end of the tunnel is not an oncoming train. No, the light we see at the end of the tunnel is... Before he could finish the sentence, the castle hill erupted with a loud chuff-boom sound, spraying meringue and chocolate sauce throughout the room. Simultaneously, a silo of multicolored flames shot upward from Dr. Dark's bushy bun hairdo. Look! Someone cried out. It's, it's, someone standard. Joan Dark with her hair on fire, Professor Mallard screamed. Someone put it out. By this time, well aware of her plight, Dr. Dark was screaming and slapping at her flaming hair with both hands. Eight strapping waiters led by Kovacs, the event manager, arrived with water buckets and doused her, while Kovacs let loose with a fire extinguisher. In a panic and unable to see, Dr. Dark dove headfirst off the stage into the baked Alaska. She came to rest with her face in a bowl of cherries nestled between the lions and her posterior propped up in an upward trajectory by what was left of the castle hill. An emergency medical team arrived and, afraid to move her, wheeled the entire dessert cart to the ambulance and rushed to the hospital. Amidst the chaos, Laszlo took French leave and returned to his room unnoticed. Soon Kovacs arrived. We got it from all angles, Laszlo, just like you wanted, he said. It's all on this DVD, edited and compressed. Be careful, this is the only copy. Kovacs handed over the DVD and trotted back to the banquet hall. Tapping into a high-speed wireless connection... Laszlo uploaded the video and sent out an anonymous viral announcement to 6,000 viewers. He then uncorked a fresh bottle of Tokay and turned on the TV. Within the hour, the footage appeared on CNN, the BBC, Sky News, and the local Budapest channels. Within 24 hours, Joan Dark, with her hair on fire, had become the most watched video on the web and stayed at the top of the charts for weeks. Of course, there was an investigation. In fact, the hotel security staff and the Budapest police had questioned Laszlo while he was still watching the initial television news reports in his hotel room. Although suspicion naturally fell on Laszlo, there was no evidence that he had caused the fire. In fact, they could not entirely explain how the fire had started, nor why it had caused no real damage. The only injuries Dr. Dark suffered were to her pride and dignity. Otherwise, she was virtually unscratched. Even the flames had failed to burn her hair. In the end, they termed the event a freak accident and brought no charges. Laszlo stayed in his room at the Hotel Gellert, drinking tokay, smoking cigars, and, with the able assistance of Janusz Moschalko, writing a book about parallel dimensions. Because of his extraordinary exposure due to this incident, his book, entitled The Rat's Nest Revealed, became an enormous bestseller, and he traveled the world giving speeches and appearing on talk shows. This brought in so much money that he formed an investment syndicate, bought the Hotel Gellert, and set up permanent residence in his room there. Meanwhile, driven out of academia by laughter and derision, Dr. Dark and Professor Mallard married and became wildly successful televangelists by using string theory to support creationism and other fundamentalist beliefs. According to the Dark-Mallard principle, some 10,000 years ago, God caused several parallel universes to collide, 
thus creating our universe, the earth, and everything in it, including the human race and prehistoric remains from other dimensions. This latter point conveniently explained, among other things, the dinosaurs. Their success also gave rise to a series of popular self-help books, including the perennial favorite, Freak It All, How to Profit from Unexpected Events. Several years later, at the peak of their new careers, Dr. Dark and Professor Mallard were taken aback when they encountered Laszlo Fringe standing by the entrance to their hotel in New York City. He bowed slightly and motioned for them to enter first. Nodding a silent thank you, they quickly spun through the revolving doors. Emerging into the lobby, they were shocked to find Laszlo already there, leaning against a pillar some distance from the doors, reading a Budapest newspaper. Holding each other tightly and averting their eyes, they walked past Laszlo in silence, unable to see the slight smile playing across his face.